I went from a Malaysian passport to a US passport in less than 12 months with no green card, with no visa, anything in between. Joel Yi, the founder and CEO of Scale Asia, a management and consulting firm that is going to be going public in Malaysia. He specializes in building high performance sales teams across the world. I was Dan Lok sales director for four plus years. We grew to a hundred reps. We did over $40 million in one year. When there are promises of like equity, and profit share. And you hear that year after year after year and it never comes true. Getting more and doing more and building greater things. All these promises never came to me. I think it's time for me to do my own thing. I'm taking my new company, my new venture, Scale Asia, public in the next 12 months. Targeting primarily corporate and enterprise companies that sells like a printing service to like different B2B audiences. That's what the market in Malaysia wants. And we're like the only sales consulting agency or firm that's doing this in Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Legacy and Billions. And today I have the honor and privilege to be able to introduce to you my man, Joel Yi, who is the founder and CEO of Scale Asia, a management and consulting firm that is going to be going public in Malaysia. And he specializes in building high performance sales teams across the world. So I'm excited to dive in and really obtain some tactical strategies that we can use and implement to take our business to the next level. So Joel, welcome to the show, my man. Thanks for having me, Christian. Absolutely. Uh, I love it. Miami is great, by the way. Yes, sir, yeah. man. Can't complain. The Sunshine State. Yes, sir. Good to have you here, brother. So why don't you walk me through, man, um, a little bit of your background and your story. Where are you from? Yeah. And how did this journey all get started for yeah, you? Yeah. Okay. So I'll tell you about a bit of a personal story and in a, how it ties into business. So yeah. I was born and raised in Malaysia in a very small town called Kuching. And when I was younger, I was actually a state sprinter. So it was very competitive. I was running. Uh, my top time for a 100 meter dash was like 10.92 seconds. So I was pretty fast uh, for, uh, under, under 15. So uh, when I was younger, you know, I was thinking like, do I become an athlete? But then I realized for my country, Malaysia, honestly, there wasn't much of a, a future in that sense, right? Mm. We're not a top nation in terms of athletics, right? Mm. So I was very blessed and very fortunate uh, by the grace of God. My parents had enough funds at that time to look for opportunities outside the country. Mm. So I started looking into schools in the US and I found a college in Seattle, Washington, a community college actually. Mm. So I went to the community college and I was an international student. So I'm Malaysian. And then in 20, in 20, so I did my school, I did my college, right? And then in 2015, I found out through a Google search that the US military was looking for foreigners that could speak foreign languages. And in exchange, we will become U.S. citizens. Mm. So this is sort of the, the, the climax, it's getting to the climax here where like, I basically enlisted in the U.S. Army. I learned, I spoke Indonesian, I still speak Indonesian, and I became a U.S. citizen. Mm. So then, this is a crazy story though. I went from a Malaysian passport to a U.S. passport in less than 12 months with no green card, with no visa, anything in between. Now, this program by the government has now been shut down. Mm -hmm. So I'm like one of 5,000 people that managed to go through it. So I'm very, very blessed again, very thankful Amen. to God for that. Um, and that gave me basically new opportunities and a new, a new hope in life. And I was a commission officer, so I did ROTC, a ROTC, to my university in Tacoma, Washington, became a commission officer. And then this kind of transitions into the business journey. Back at the time, I was dating my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, she was in army training for five weeks and, you know, I was lonely in this new city called Carbondale, Illinois, cause I moved from Washington to Illinois to be with her. And I was like doom scrolling, right? Doom scrolling on Facebook one day. And I kept seeing this guy in a red suit, this Asian dude. And he, he, he kept talking about, you can make six figures online, make money online. And for like two weeks, I thought he was a scam. And then one night I was so lonely, so bored. I clicked on his ad. I watched his webinar. 90 minutes later, I took out a credit card with money I didn't have and I bought his course. His name was Dan Locke wow. and it was the high ticket closer program. So I learned how to close high ticket sales online and that's what I did um, basically to make my first six figures. I made my first six figures doing online sales, closing coaching programs, info products, selling mastermind events. And then I think Dan saw the leadership he had in, I had in me and he promoted me slowly to like assistant sales manager, sales manager, and then I became sales director. Within his organization? Yeah. So I was Dan Locke's sales director for four plus years. Wow. And I built a sales team from just 10 guys at a time, myself included. We grew to 100 reps. 
And at the best year we did, we did over forty million dollars in one year in sales coaching. It's incredible. And yeah. So since then, now this is like the fast forward. I've worked with a lot of coaching brands, um, like Ru uh, Rudy Marr, who's here in Miami. Brandon yeah. Carter was a client of mine for over a year. He's here in Miami. Ryan Pineda. We built his entire HubSpot system, um, training sales team, and we worked with now now Tom Wang, an eight figure Amazon FBA guy. So. So that's the background in terms of like my first business was is a U.S. sort of coaching sales agency, mm. and I can talk about the Malaysia part now. If I know, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going for curious, quite a I have bit. a couple yeah. questions, man. <laughs> sure, thanks go for, for it, sharing for that because yeah, I know that you've it. been doing this for a very long time. Sure. And so, what was it like to transition from working with somebody like Dan Locke to now starting your own business? Yeah. What did you see that was like? You know what? It's time for me to get in my own business. Yeah, I love that question. Um, and since you're a man of faith, I, I love that I can speak about this because yeah. when, I was with, when I was in Dan's organization, and, and this is like, I'll take you back a little bit. When I came to the U.S., I was 16. And I think at, as a young man at 16, with a lot of freedom, you could pretty much do whatever you want, right? I, have a lot, I had a lot of friends that experimented with drugs and, you know, partying and alcohol and, you know, all the, all the basically everything you think of. And for whatever reason, I always never had an interest in those things. I always felt like the hand of God was upon me. And even though back then, I would say my relationship with Jesus wasn't really like deep. It was more like my parents, God, and my parents, Jesus, right? But for me at that time at 16, I was just like doing my own thing. But I always felt like he had his hand on, on me and guiding my path because when I was working for Dan, I kept till this day feeling the same thing of like, Joel, you have to be surrounded with more faith-filled people. You have to work with people that are more faithful. I, and until this day, I feel the same. Like, because at Dan's company, no one was Christian. So that's part of the reason why I actually left. Because not only was it to do my own thing, but I just felt like I had to be in an environment where I could grow my personal faith, but then also eventually help, you know, inspire people and show, show people the love of God. So that was the biggest reason. The second reason was when, you're, when I worked for Dan for four years, and I think this is a problem, not, not really a problem, because I'm always grateful, for, grateful to Dan. He's my first mentor, my first boss. He gave me all these opportunities. I wouldn't be even sitting here without him. But in terms of a leadership perspective, because I'm really big on this, you know, when there are promises of like equity and profit share, and you hear that year after year after year, and it never comes true, then your team starts wondering, is this whole thing really legit? Is it worth it? I think that happened to me where I was in the executive team for like four years, and there was always talks of like getting more and doing more and building greater things, but they just never came to fruition. So eventually at 26 years old, I was like, okay, I spent four and four or five years in this organization. I've built Dan's brand, helped him build it. It was great. I think it's time for me to do my own thing just because all these promises never came to be. Mm. So those were the two main reasons why, mm. why I left and did my own thing. And so yeah. starting your own thing, how was that experience of you starting your company from scratch and then, yeah. you know, growing, scaling, recruiting? Yeah, that's just such a, such a funny, but also it reminds me of like of all the lessons and the hardship because yeah. we went, I went through so much. Um, initially, like when I first left Dan's company, you know, I kind of did it, I would say the smart way because when I left, I already had another like business partner lined up where we were already making good revenue, good profit. And basically what the business I did initially was like an offer publishing business. So we would take like a coach who was good on YouTube, for example, a great YouTuber, and we would help him sell high ticket coaching services. Mm. So we would do like the marketing, the sales, the operations, everything. And slowly, and we made good money for that, for that year after I left Dan. But the problem is I realized I didn't want to do all of that. I just wanted to focus on the sales team, mm. right? Um, but that transition was tough because in that one and a half years of me quitting Dan's, one year of me quitting Dan's company, I tried to launch my own offers. And I did a few offers and I made a big, and I take ownership for this because there was a, there's an offer where I launched and it was helping companies revive their list of dead leads. We call it sales farming. And mind you, it's still very effective. Like we use it for all our different clients and partners to this day, it works amazing. But I launched it more as a one-time service. And the big mistake I made was I gave a guarantee money back and I couldn't control or really manage their sales team. So you can imagine where the problem came. Was I went like, through a similar situation. We like that. booked these sales calls through there from the dead leads, but their guys couldn't close. And from ethics and also to protect reputation, I gave everybody a full refund, even though we did the work. So that decision cost me over a hundred grand in, in just losses, right? Uh, so that was part of my journey. It was very painful, but I learned a lot from it. And I'm thankful I went through it. 
it was very hard in that moment. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. And so now looking back through establishing your company yes. and um, what have you built? What have you accomplished? Just to give some context to the audience. Yeah, how, absolutely. So you've been in business for how long? Two years okay. on my own. And in those two years, we've won a two comma club award each year. So a million to two million in gener a revenue generate for our own business. And we've also won our clients probably about three or four of the bigger awards for them just running their sales teams. Right. And I've also now moved and relocated to Malaysia where I'm taking my, my new company, my new venture, Scale Asia, public in the next 12 months. So that's a different company outside of the sales? Correct. So my US company is called Scale Team Circle and then the Malaysian company is called Scale Asia. But they do similar functions. Got it. Just yeah. in different markets. Different markets. And in Scale Asia, we're targeting primarily corporate and enterprise companies, not really, not coaching and online businesses. Mm, so it's running the same strategies for sales and running high Absolutely. performance teams, but in the corporate setting in person. Absolutely. Yes. So we've oh, got understood. a client like that sells like a printing service to like different B2B audiences. So, and that's the reason why we can go public because that's what the market in Malaysia wants. Mm. Right. And we're like the only sales consulting agency or firm that's doing this in Malaysia. Got it. And so let's talk about some of the practical, high performing sales strategies that you can share with the audience. What are yes. some um, principles if a business owner is looking to build a high performing sales teams? 100%. What would you recommend? Yeah, that's a saying, you know, um, you hire for attitude and you train for skill. And I think it applies to a lot of businesses and sports. Uh, but I also think similar to professional sports, here's how I look at sales. I don't know if you played any professional sports or the military, uh, but I look at it at the exact same way where like it's a profession. I feel like a lot of sales teams are not good, are mediocre because everybody, including the business owner, treats the team like they're just a bunch of sales reps. So when you actually switch the, the mindset of like, these guys are not sales reps, these guys are sales pros, sales professionals. It brings a whole new light to that meaning because the best analogy I can give is like, let's say we wanted to be professional basketball players, right? That's the difference between playing every Sunday amateur basketball versus playing professionally. Because you could be a good Sunday league baseball, a basketball player, but the practice, the training, the talent that's needed to become pro is completely different. So for one of, one of the first things that we do when we take over a company and we optimize their sales team is we instill this mindset of professionalism in the team itself. Mm. And if people don't want to get with it, they get out. Yeah. So the ones that stay, and this is where it gets great because A players like A players. A players don't want to play with B and C players. So we, we find this great divide between the reps that want to be A players and reps that don't. And, and most of the times, most sales professionals want to be A players. Yeah. They just never had the leadership, the coaching, or the environment to thrive. So we come in and create that environment for them. Mm. So that's the first, the first most important thing. And what would you say is second or third? Second would be then the actual development of habits. Because now you can say, look, we want to be a pro team. We want to be like Navy SEALs, right? But how do we get there? Yeah. So next, we instill habits. Mm. So habits, and this is crazy because like, if I was a pro basketball player, I wouldn't just roll out of bed, drive myself to the stadium and go compete in a match. Mm. No. I wake up, meditation, routines, physical workouts, rehearsals, right? Maybe we're going to watch game tape and our coach is going to drill us. Then we're going to have a pep talk. Most sales guys don't do that. They literally get out of bed and get on the phone and start closing. Or they get out of bed, get in a car and go make sales. It's like, it's crazy. So we instill habits like morning routine. So we have a very thorough morning routine that every rep goes through to get ready for their day. Things like that. That's amazing, man. And so you implement that also for the companies and you tell them, hey, this is how your morning should operate in order for you to increase your performance and maximize your effectiveness on your day to day. 100%. Got it. And uh, number three, what would so you yeah, say? So we went from the environment, right? Yeah. The culture now to the habits. The third thing is now all the training that we do. So my team of managers and myself, we have experience in high ticket sales because we've done the closing and the setting. Uh, so then we have our own framework of training that we basically train the reps. So we do one-on-ones with each rep every single week. On the one-on-ones, we talk about not always training and call reviews, but we talk about personal stuff too. Because what, what I found, what makes a good sales professional and a great sales professional is that the great sales professional has their personal life really dialed in mm. like they're mature they got faith you know they deal with heart you know emotionally emotionally very well a good sales professional gets swayed by their emotions 
by their family, by their wife, by their spouse, right? By their kids. So on the one on one, which is part of our training, we talk about these things. We're not therapists, we're not counselors, Ooh. but we do kind of the work of a therapist and a counselor because I kind of think it has great. This to is the first part time I've of heard it. of it. Yeah, that's yeah. so good. But if you think about it, like, because this is the coaching space, right? And we sell coaching, a lot of our prospects need the same work. So I tell my guys all the time, I'm like, how can you expect someone to invest in a $25,000 mastermind if, like, you yourself haven't done the work internally? Because that would be pretty hypocritical. Like, if you haven't invested that much money yourself or you don't have the mental wherewithal or, like, just the mental understanding to, to help people, then you should fix your personal stuff first. So that's kind of what we walk them through. And then training that's would be on, like, on skills. So we train, like, tonality, say this, right? When a prospect says this, you handle the objection this way. So that would be, like, the third thing. It's, like, all the training that comes into it. That's incredible, man. Yeah. I love everything that you shared. Thank you. And so when it comes to sales... Um, do you have a specific framework or process? I think I saw that yes. you do like some emotional. Yes, 100%. So my framework that I've coined the term is called the emotional selling process. And to really break this down in a simple term, term simple terms. Um, well, before I do that, like the context for this is that because we've been selling coaching and info for the past seven years, we found that a lot of our prospects, and this is true, they have this, you know, this is famous sales quote where prospects of people buy based on emotions and then they justify logic, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very different that we've, like we found compared to like selling, you know, a software where it's more like features and benefits and the ROI and just like the cost, right? And like, so when we sell info, we tap into all the emotions of the prospect. So I'll give an example, like in one of our frameworks, you know, we have the frame. So we frame the call, right? We say, hey, Mr. Prospect, on this call today, a lot of people here want to make six figures online. The truth is I speak to many of them and I find out that very few of them actually get to do it. So on this call, I want to cover some of the traits that these six figure earners have. Is it okay if I ask you some questions to kind of go through this discovery together? So we'll frame the call and then in discovery, right, which is the sales digging process of information, we go into what we call level three pains and goals. So, and this is very valuable for anyone listening or watching because level one is the superficial. So for example, if I ask a prospect, so Mr. Prospect, you know, why would you like to make 100K a year or six figures, right? Like, why do you want to make 10K a month? Most prospects will say, well, because I want to, I got bills to pay and I want less stress and I want financial freedom. I want to travel. That is level one. Superficial. Yeah. Superficial, right? Level two would be something like, um, I want to travel and take my kids because my kids have never got to travel, right? And I would love to be a great, an awesome dad and mom for them. Okay, good, that's, some, that's getting a bit deeper, that's level two. But then the level three, and this is where most sales professionals don't go, they don't know how to go deep, or they're not comfortable going deep. We start asking them questions about, so I'm just out of curiosity, Mr. Prospect, what, how was your childhood like? Like, I know you want all these things, but what has happened? Like, I'm curious, did something happen to you when you were young with your parents? Mm. Did they take you to travel to these places? And then they start revealing things like, oh my gosh, like, you know, my mom and dad never actually did. We didn't have money. And then we start tapping into it. We say, okay, so it seems like you really want to be an awesome dad for your kids. They go, yeah. And how long have you been wanting to do this for? Oh my gosh, since, you know, since they were born. Okay. And then so we go that deep. And so at the end, now we get this level three, for example, in this case, like, I want to be the best dad for my kids because my parents were not that for me we take this all the way through to the pitch, to the objections, and we get the sale. Mm. Because see, here's the thing I tell my reps all the time. When someone's investing 5K, 10K, 20K in, in a coaching program, they're not doing that to buy a bunch of videos and coaching calls. They really don't give a, a damn, right, about that. What they want is the feeling or the outcome, the results that your coaching program gives them. So we focus it all on like, miss a prospect. Remember, you're investing $20,000 on being able to help your kids go travel, be the best that you can be, right? And so when we rely on the prospects on this, that's how we get the sale. And that's what we call emotional selling process in a nutshell. That is fantastic, <laughs> man. I can see you got this dialed into yeah, the so team. That's what we've been teaching for seven years, yeah. Excellent, man. And so do you want to talk a little bit about the project in Malaysia that you got going on? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and I think this goes into a lot about mentorship, right? Why I think people should invest in mentorship because even for, for me, myself personally, the first product I invested in was Dan's high ticket closer program, right? 2,500 bucks. But since then I've invested 10, 
10x? No, 100x, right? 10, yeah. I've invested over $250,000 into coaching, mastermind, networking events. For example, I was in Russell Brunson's inner circle. Um, I was in Rudy Mars' inner circle. Um, Jeremy Haynes, who's down in Miami's inner circle. So I do a lot of this networking and mastermind because I realize I have so much more to learn. And this ties into the Malaysia project because through these masterminds that I've been to, I met this business partner in Malaysia who was in Russell's inner circle. So because I invested in Russell's inner circle and we went to this really cool place in Mexico last year, I met this other guy from Malaysia. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's another Malaysian guy here because we don't really meet a lot of Malaysian yeah. people in, the coach, in, this, in this online info space, yeah. right? And it turns out he isn't an info guy. So I was like, why are you here in Russell's thing? It's like, oh, I run a private equity firm and I just traveled to all these events to learn. I'm like, that's incredible. So he literally goes to all these different events and masterminds on, in all different niches just to learn. And I'm like, dude, I gotta, I gotta connect with you. So over the past year, we've been chatting and he was like, Joel, you're Malaysian. And I'm like, yeah, I'm Malaysian, right? And, and he was like, do you know that there's a lot of opportunity in Malaysia? I'm like, tell me more. He said, a lot of things that we do in Malaysia are about five years behind what you guys do in America. And I was like, oh, that's fascinating. What do you mean by that? So he's like, um, I'm not, are you familiar with a lot of um, like Jeff Walker and a product launch formula in the info coaching space? Not with Jeff Walker okay. and product launch. Got I it. have gone to Funnel Hacking Live yeah, and exactly. been a part of different okay. masterminds, but not deep. Uh, okay, so the example he gave was like, Jeff Walker used to be the guy that started this like info thing with the product launch formula. And he was telling me how- this He was before Russell? Way before. Russell oh. learned from guys like Jeff Walker. Oh, so God. he was telling me like, guys like Jeff Walker stuff, is still what they use in Malaysia versus us here. We're like already in Russell and all these different Alex Ramosi. They're like, so, so he's like, yeah, Joel, if you could bring what you do with sales teams in North America, you could bring it to Malaysia. We could really crush this. And what really excited me because, you know, Christian, like why would I run the same exact business model there and here? Like it's the same thing, right? I could combine it. But the draw of this Malaysia company was the, the fact that we could go public because going public adds a different credibility to my brand. Mm. And not only that, when we go public in Malaysia, our, like, let's say a dollar, right? The currency, we get a 10 to 14 X multiple price earning multiple on that dollar. Cause you go public. Mm. And so now we're trading shares publicly and people with money are coming in buying our shares. So, so I was really drawn by that because I can't do that in my coaching business yeah. in, in North America. I just can't go public. And, and we maybe could exit our business, but if it's so personal brand heavy, and I'm sure you're aware of this, like it's hard to sell a personal yeah, brand business. Right. So that's the draw of why I did, why I made that move. That's excellent, man. That's incredible. It seems like you got so many exciting <laughs> things going on. Yeah. Thank you. And so you learned most of what you did through sales and leadership through Dan. Yes. Then you took what you learned, you gave it your own twist, you yes. implemented your own principles and strategies, and now you've launched your own high-performing sales team business. Yes. You've worked with some of the top entrepreneurs and influencers in the space. Now you're impacting people in Malaysia, your home country, yes. you're going public, you're doing some extraordinary yeah. stuff, man. Thank you. And Thank so you. What, what's, what's what drives you? Um, you know, it's a great question. At first, I actually want to say like, all this couldn't be possible without God, right? Amen Glory to, to God, because there was a point in my life where, and, and I got married, uh, I would say relatively young. I, I got married at 22. My wife is 23, so we've been married five years now. And also by the grace of God, we're still together because being married at a young age is very challenging, right? Especially like, I was young, I want to make a bunch of money and all stuff like, and I was a lot more, a lot more immature back then because I was doing it like for the money versus now I think I have a better head screwed on where it's more for the kingdom, but ultimately I found a big passion for why I do what I do. And I found that out recently, maybe in the past six months, which is I want to help a lot of people heal from their childhood trauma. Wow. So I'm, I'm a, that's like my big purpose now. And like, I wanna open up, I'm opening up a nonprofit in Malaysia. I'm putting money in there because I want to help, especially Asian folk heal from childhood trauma. And, and I'll tell you a bit of context to this because this concept of trauma is so taboo still in Malaysia. And I think in many parts of Asia, that's why suicide rates are so high. Like in Singapore, South Korea, right? People are having, there's so much suicide because Mental health is seen as taboo. Like I remember growing up, if you went to see a therapist or a mental like counselor, psychologist, people would think you were crazy. So it didn't help, right? And it's, it's still a very similar thing. And I realized like I could only grow. I could only have change, right? Of course, God won. 
but ultimately I had to also heal from the trauma and the things of what I, what I went through in life. So mm. um, I think that's the big thing that drives me for man, that's, what I do right that, now. That's beautiful, man. And yeah. so what was that process for you overcoming those traumas? Did you use self-development? Did you yes. see a psychologist, a saw counselor? Like what were some yeah. of the modalities that you used? Okay. So I, I think to be very frank, um, I've not been to like psychiatrists, you know, we, we, we do like um, marriage counseling classes and stuff like that, you know, part of the church. Yeah. But ultimately, most of my personal development journey has been through my personal relation, relationship with Jesus and God, Amen. which has been great. So, through the scripture. Yeah, through the scripture. But also I have done um, courses like that's a very famous um, experiential program, which is for personal development called Money and You. It's typically in San Diego every quarter-ish and Tony Robbins went through it at 21 years old uh mm. Robert Kiyosaki was a business he was an instructor and a business partner in a business so a lot of these great legends like T. Harf Ecker they all went through money and you and I did that, that makes a lot of I sense. did that last uh November or yeah last November so I think that was like the main the only one that I really went through but throughout the whole past couple of years through scripture through praying through just you know church leaders I've been able to heal it's fantastic yeah. man that's beautiful. Thank and I'm you. curious that that mastermind or that event, mm -hmm. is, is there a book or it's just online? There's, I mean, a, or, there's or also a, a book called the money. It's called a money and you book, mm. but then the life, the experiential event is three and a half days. Got it. Yeah. Got it. That's incredible, man. Thank you. Wow. You just have incredible energy, man. I'm, I'm kind of speechless with your story <laughs> and all the great things that you've been Appreciate able to accomplish. It. How old are you now? I'm 28 this year. 28. Yeah. yeah Born man, in at such a young age. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's freaking you. awesome. Thank and you. so what's, what's next for you? What's, uh, yeah. what, what's your next move aside from going public? Yeah. I know you got a lot of things going on, but yes. what's ultimately the legacy? You know, what? and that's, I think the thing we talk about many different things, but I think really the biggest thing for me in this season of life has been like focusing right on that one thing because even with these comp this company scale asia in malaysia and my my u.s company scale team circle we've been trying to mesh them both so that way i'm way more focused on one thing instead of two things so we're in the season right now where like we're consolidating our resources or we're moving our team members here here so it's gonna be fine because it's still the same trajectory it's just like i want to keep everything focused mm. right because i think without focus it's very hard to grow bigger businesses and then uh my legacy is yeah that nonprofit, that foundation where you know we can actually pour in money and do sponsorship because for example the money and you event in Mal that's actually it actually runs in malaysia too so this money and you event it's a big franchise and it runs in china malaysia the us uh, japan um and the fees in malaysia are not that cheap right it's about five thousand us which is a lot of money in malaysia i would like to be able to sponsor you know young adults and teenagers to go um, so that's kind of like what I want to do next. So it's really about, because I, I realized one thing, right? And I would say I realized this, thankfully, at this age. It's like the more I focus on the kingdom, on God, and also focus on helping people, like truly helping people, not like make money off them, right? Yeah. The more opportunities just come from left field, from God. from you. I don't even have to focus on making money, per se. Yeah. I just focus on doing the right, like what I feel is the right things. And so that I would say that's like my big, focus now the big like the big legacy that's yeah. amazing man and so who mm -hmm. aside from Don Locke, who were some mentors, mentors that you had that really poured into yeah you? um so after dan so then i invested about thirty thousand dollars total with dan i invested about over fifty thousand uh, fifty thousand dollars with rudy mar here in miami he yeah. was in tampa before invested about twenty five thousand with jeremy haynes who's south of miami and russell brunson 50k plus and then Ryan Pineda was about 30K per, per se. And then that would, I would say those in the coaching space would be the main like five, four or five guys. And so marketers. are you looking to recruit or hire new sales pros for your company? Always. Always? We are always looking for talent. Got it. So yeah, if someone's like watching this or listening. Yeah, that's why I was like, asking. You like what we're saying, please apply. Please reach out to me and just do like DM me. We're always recruiting. Beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful. And is there anything else that you might want to share that maybe we haven't touched base on? That no, would be valuable for the audience. I think you've asked amazing questions today. Thank you, Christian. Um, and now I just say, like, let's keep growing. Let's keep crushing Amen. it. Let's yeah. do it, my man. Amen. Well, where can people follow you, look up yeah. your information, and, and get in contact with yeah. me? So the main, my main website is joeyi.com. But if you want to apply for any sales teams, ask me any questions, feel free to DM me at official joeyi on Instagram. Guys, you heard it from the man himself. He's been 
building high performing cell seams and doing extraordinary work and building all for the kingdom which is a beautiful thing man god bless you thank you for coming on here and we'll catch you guys on the next one